SJC 13208, Paul Mahan v. Boston Retirement Board. Okay, Attorney Poser, when you're ready. May it please the court, by my glasses. Sure. <laughs> Your Honors, this is a case of first impression. Uh, the, the issue before you is whether or not um, a inactive member of the Boston Retirement System, Paul Mahan, um, who committed crimes commencing two years and change after he retired, um, can be have his pension forfeited under Chapter 32, Section 15.3. I understand why you say it's an issue of first impression, uh, since we don't have the case evidently where the crime was committed after the pension has already been in place. But, but we have um, footnote 12 in the uh, Somerville uh, retirement case with the uh, John Omer. And it's pretty clear in, in, in that footnote that the um, statute, Chapter 32, Section 15.4, uh, pertains to any member of a retirement system. As a matter of fact, in that case, the registered probate was no longer uh, uh, working as an alderman um, in some of them. So a pretty strong footnote. Um, and, and the footnote also indicates that the legislature would have said uh, any members in service instead of any members. So why is this really a case of first impression? <laughs> Your Honor, because in the Bonomo case, which was a case I argued in front of this this court in uh, 2014, um, Mr. Bonomo was an employee of the Commonwealth, and the the SJC in that case also said that member in the context of Chapter 32, Section 15.4, and the language is the same in, in the in the context in Chapter 32, Section 15.3, referred to the definition of member in Chapter 32, Section 1 as an em any employee. And the footnote you refer to deals with the actual issue in the Bonomo case, which I had argued successfully before the district court and the superior court, that Mr. Bonomo, because he had no pension rights associated with his employment with the Commonwealth as register of probate, uh, and thus was not an active member of the Somerville retirement system at the time of commissioning the crimes from which he is receiving his pension, was exempt from 15.4. This court found differently. Um, so there's a distinction between a member in service, which is an active employee earning a pension, and a member inactive, such as Mr. Bun Mr. Um, uh, Mahan, who was a retired. What about uh, section six, chapter 32, section six? Only a member in service may apply for ordinary disability. Again, the legislature knows how to do it. Well, absolutely, but that's not that, that's a slightly different situation because that refer you can only retire as a as you point out, Your Honor, in uh, ordinary disability retirement from active service with a disability that, that case called Vest, uh, Vest versus Boston Retirement Board, a case that I argued in the appeals court in 1996 that says that you cannot have a, a disability that it, it was sort of this germs of which existed while you are uh, an active employee, but subsequently matured in the language of the case after you separated from your employment. It, so, isn't this a weird case to make your argument though? He got permanent total disability. Did he get permanent total workers comp? Yes, he did, Your Honor. So he, he got, lumped some, meaning he'll never be able to work again in his life, right? Well, Your Honor, he never got a lump sum of well, his workers' comp. Bear with me for a second. So the workers' comp he got, right, was based on the fact that he would never be able to work again. Well, workers' compensation, particularly um, total and permanent workers' compensation, is uh, for lack of earning capacity. Um, so he had, no, again, no earning capacity, then, in your terminology. But at the same time, he clearly has earning capacity because he's running a car lot or whatever he's doing here. So when he's collecting that worker's comp, that's, that's a fraud on the government itself. Which he was convicted of. Right, but that's suggesting... There's an interconnection between his ability to work and his pension here. To me, I just don't find this that difficult a case because, again, 
there's a fraud going on here that he is able to work so he shouldn't be able to be collecting workers comp so i find that i don't have to do this sort of machination that this is a really difficult case because he's engaged in fraud after he's left work because he's by collecting a permanent total workers comp he's engaged in fraud while he's working i mean it, it it's you can't separate the time period um, out justice uh, kafter with great respect there's no proof in this case that he was engaged in fraud while he was earning his workers comp the, the, the but again it's workers a compensation fraud again, allegations and I, and begin I'll, in I keep cutting you off, but i'll stop cutting you off but i just want to frame the question right he got it he didn't get a temporary you know workers comp he got you know he got the full you know workers comp for total and permanent right correct so that suggests to me that he shouldn't have any earning capacity the rest of his life and when I, he I don't disagree with you about that okay so that makes it hard for you to win this case I think well your honor my analysis is, is <laughs> I never said this was a difficult case <laughs> I think it's actually a very straightforward case um, well I do too but right now <laughs> the other way well, you have a vote and I don't <laughs> so I want to convince you all that, that my, my side is right the the, the, the sine qua non of, and we're looking at 15.4 now, 15.3 I'll address in a moment. 15.4 is triggered in every other case except this one by criminal activity while one was a public employee. And, and, and except in the Bonomo case, while the member of the system was an active employee and um, used in some way the job, the, the public employment, to facilitate the, convict, the commission of the crime. So I think that's a, that, that's a fair point. Obviously, in the, uh, in, in the Finneran case, uh, there's, there's discussion uh, as well about you know, factual links and facilitating. Uh, and here, the, the job is not being used to facilitate the crime because he's not in the job. He was not convicted of pension fraud. He was convicted of workers' compensation fraud, which is not the same thing. And also, his workers' compensation, the permanent workers' compensation, was awarded in 2006, the year that he started his criminal activity. Um, so, meaning that while he was um, working in, he got hurt in 20, 2000. From 2000 to 2006, presumably, because there's no allegation of fraud prior to 2006, that his workers' compensation, again, not a pension, um, was bona fide. When does he start working at the car place? 2006, sir. Uh, that's my understanding. Um, I, I, then that makes sense. So from 2000 to 2006, maybe he is incapacitated. Um, but once he starts working, He's no, then the workers' comp claim, there's some question about whether that was properly awarded. And I understand it's different because we're having to look at it through the pension lens rather than the workers' comp lens. Uh, and, and again, he didn't lump some out. He, he, got, he was getting ongoing payments of workers' comp? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so he again. was continuing to receive those. In certain ways, that's worse for you, isn't it? Because he's receiving the workers' comp even though he's working. Does he have to make certifications when he's doing that? I don't know how it works after when you don't lump some. 
Your Honor, I'm not a workers' comp lawyer. My understanding, just from the record, is that uh, every six months, uh, an affidavit was required to be filled out saying that he was not working and not earning. And Mr. Mahon. But then, isn't that a real problem for you? Because if he is filling out that app, that affidavit, then it isn't just a pension fraud issue, it's a workers' comp fraud, and it's related to his, the job he had. You know, well, Your Honor, I don't think it is. And, and I, I, you know, so I'm gonna give you a lawyerly answer because this is so a very This is the right answer. place for that. <laughs> so, um, there is, going back to the facilitation analysis under 15.4, which I think is, if you read all the cases, and I've, I've read all the cases, I've lost most of the cases, so I think I understand the way the court looks at these things. If you have to have a public job to facilitate the commission of the crime. Now, there's no question that he had to be a corrections officer and get hurt to be entitled to workers' compensation. But there's nothing about his being a corrections officer, which he didn't, the job which he did not hold for over two years when the, when the criminal activity started, um, that facilitated corrections officer guarding prisoners, facilitated him lying to the workers' comp people about his activities post-retirement. Because there is no possible, I mean, the physics of it don't work. You cannot but, facilitate but your job. But isn't he re retired because and getting a pension because he uh, got injured and is getting workers' comp, and now he shouldn't be getting workers' comp and he shouldn't be getting pension either because he should be working? A couple of points. Number one, because of the op operation of General Laws Chapter 32, Section 14, which is workers' compensation offset, in essence, Mr. Mahon was not being paid by the retirement board during the pendency of the case. Even though he would technically had accidental disability retirement, because well, how his- How long is that? How long a period would that be? It would be the entire time. Uh, well, from up till 2003, he got per total and permanent workers' comp in 2006, but because he was a corrections officer, and I'm not sure whether it's chapter 800 or it's, um, uh, other forms of assault pay. Because he was a corrections officer, he was getting assault pay. So that's a supplement to workers' compensation. So whether he was on total temporary, which is 60%, he would get 40% supplement to, to achieve 100% of his pay while he was out on workers' comp. So that never changed, which again is incongruous why somebody applied for accidental disability retirement, but if he hadn't, we wouldn't be here. But go back to the supervised commission first for me, because that's basically, I mean, Judge McKenna's Judge McKenna did a tinkers to Evans to chance analysis. There, you start with hiring as a corrections officer, and then you get you get hurt, and that puts you in position to get workers' comp, which then puts you in the position to get accidental disability retirement, which then puts you in the position to lie about your eligibility for workers' comp, and then you get convicted of that. Those are that's five steps. That's a, is that a direct link? And I, the court has never defined what a direct link means. I, I don't think that's close enough. I have, didn't made, did not make a direct link argument and what that means because it's an elastic term. But it's, it's my view that 15.4 has to be triggered by an active employee. There's no five links in Chief Justice Budget question. There's that the, uh, the workers' My analysis is that you have to have a public employment, like Bonoma, to use your job to commit the crime. And Mr. Bonomo had a key to the copy machines in the Registry of Deeds, and he used that key, which he was given as Register of Deeds, because he was Register of Deeds, 
to unlock the copy, copy machine coin boxes and take money out of the, out of the till. But it also had nothing to do with his job as an Albany attorney. Exactly. And that was a successful argument up until the SJC decision. And I'm not saying the SJC <laughs> decision was wrong. I'm just saying that, that, that the argument in Guanoma was you have to be an active employee, essentially, of Somerville to trigger pension forfeiture. This court has told us differently because he was an active employee of the Commonwealth, and that's the footnote, I think it's three, um, I don't recall exactly, in Guanomo that says that member under the definitions in Chapter 32, Section 1 is any employee. So he was an, Bonomo was an employee of the Commonwealth. He stole from the Commonwealth. And what's more, in that case, you didn't find a factual connection to his job. You found a legal connection because he was a breach the canons of ethics of. And now, and now your client's given us an opportunity to look at it in a different light, which we will do. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We're going to um, move on now to. Uh, Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Attorney Thomas. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, my name is Natasha Thomas and I represent the Boston Retirement System in this appeal. There are two issues before the court today. The first is whether or not Section 15.4 applies to Mr. Mahan as an inactive member in the system. And the second issue is whether or not there's a direct link between Mahan's criminal activity, which is workers' comp fraud, and his former position as a corrections officer. Can I ask you to take the second one first? Sorry, <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I could do that. So it's our position that this issue, the issues before the court today, the second issue has already been dealt with. It's been discussed and decided here before the court in Brunomo and Finneran and at the appeals court with Mahar. So section 15.4 states, in the event of a final conviction of a criminal offense involving a violation of the laws applicable to a member's office or position, they forfeit their pension. The criminal activity has to be connected to the public employee's position. And the courts have said that there, ha there are two types of connections. There's a legal link, and there's a direct legal link, and th there's a direct factual link. And so we're arguing before the court today that there's an actual factual link between Mahan falsifying or lying about his eligibility eligibility for workers' comp and his former position as a corrections officer. So what, what, what I think uh, Mr. Mahan's saying is in in um, in almost you have the, the public trust issue involving um, a, a administration of justice and his position in the court system. In Finneran you have uh, the Speaker of the House uh, testifying about underlying uh, 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 legislation that he was uh, intimately involved with. And here, what, what I think uh, the appellant is saying is that there's nothing that uh, the appellant did um, in his job that uh, facilitates this crime. And indeed, he didn't even have the job when the crime was that's your and it's our position that under Mahar, the crime doesn't have to be connected to the individual's job responsibilities. And under Durkin, it doesn't even have to occur at work. So Mahan, it's our position that Mahan was injured at work. He was injured while breaking a fight between inmates. Because of that injury, he applied for workers' comp. He was awarded workers' comp because he suffered an injury, breaking a fight amongst some of the inmates. And so the act was created to provide financial compensation for an employee who is incapacitated, who's no longer able to earn money. And so he was convicted of fraud. He obtained this because he lied for a period of six years about his eligibility. He was working, he was earning income, and yet he lied to preserve an employee benefit that relates back to his position as a corrections officer. So there we have the, the actual factual link between his crime and his position. But, but won't we always have that? I mean, if, if, if that's going to be the, 
if we're always going to be able to trace it back to the fact that he was the correctional officer, aren't you always going to have a factual link? Uh, I struggled with this because I'm sure you know I was the judge on Finneran and I got reversed because uh, I thought that I thought it was. I thought Mr. Posner did a good job at that time, but the, SJ, <laughs> the SJC told me differently. Um, but it's always going to go back to that initial domino, that he works for the correction facility, and whatever might come downstream after he's disabled, you're always going to be able to go back and say, well, that's a nexus. It's, that's going to be the, the, the nesting dolls. It's always going to start with the fact that he was a corrections officer. So how does that inform our analysis about the factual link if we're always going to be able to go back and say, well, whatever he does downstream, it always goes back to the fact that he started initially as a corrections officer. Well, I, respectfully, I respectfully disagree that it always traces back to that position. I think under Finneran, the SJC reversed your decision because you. they argued that <laughs> <laughs> his crime was extrinsically intertwined with his position. Mm -hmm. So we've seen cases before the SJC where the court has ruled that there is no nexus. It's not a strong nexus. Garney, for example, was the teacher who was accused or convicted of having child pornography. He used the school's email to access the website, but the court said that wasn't enough. So it's a fact-by-fact -fact analysis. You look, look at each case individually. So in the case before the court today, I would argue that it's tied extrinsically to his crime. Right? He lied under the pen penalties of perjury in order to preserve an employee benefit. Finneran lied. His job as Speaker of the House did not include testifying at the hearing, but he testified untruthfully to his job responsibilities or his involvement in the redistricting. And so the court said because he lied about that, it was tied. He also lied to vindicate his position. And it's similar here with Mahat. He lied under the penalties of perjury in order to preserve a benefit. What is that benefit? Workers' comp. How did he get it? By injuring, by getting injured, breaking up a fight, an essential function of his job for the so Suffolk County Sheriff's Department. The, the, the appellant uh, reads the cases incorrectly in saying that in direct link cases, there have to be use of the position to facilitate the crime. That that's an overstatement of his. I think it's an overstatement. I think it's a nexus, a connection extrinsically tied to that public worker's position and the crime. Mahar is uh, an example of that. He was chief of inspection. His job was to oversee plumbing systems and permits, and he broke into the personnel office in order to remove unfavorable documents from his file. That had nothing to do with his job responsibilities. Well, I wrote Mahar. That, that, that's, that's, uh, it, it does have to do with his job because he was covering up his, his bad personnel reviews, right? And that was why he broke into the, I mean, he, it's, it, he was trying to get rid of negative evaluations of himself, right? Right. I mean, I don't think, that seems quite different. Um, he, that's clearly connected to his work performance. Um, right, and the Workers' Comp Act was created to compensate injured employees who are impaired, right, who have no more earning capacity. And so he lied in order to maintain well, I, I, I have no trouble thinking that the workers' comp, when he lies about being totally and permanently disabled for workers' comp and he's working, that, that seems to be a nexus. But it's, it's not, it's a little different than the use of his position. You know, it, I, the way Judge, you know, Judge Tafoe just phrased it, the use of his position, he's not using his position the same way Mahar was using his position, or Finneran may be using, may have been using his position, where he was actually, you know, there and engaged in the task. I don't know. I, I see the difference a little bit. I'd still argue there's a connection mm -hmm. um, because, but for his position as a corrections officer, but for him performing the essential functions of his job, he wouldn't have received this benefit and. He lied in order to maintain an employee benefit that he wasn't entitled to. That argument, like with Justice Chaff Chaffin, it resonates with me too. It does, but it's it's different than the appellant's take on the case, which is that you have to use your job, your current job, to facilitate the crime. That's their take. On
And that's correct. Yes. Can you talk about can you talk, can you talk about fifteen three? So fifteen three, fifteen four is a forfeiture, and fifteen three is restitution, and so the board can suspend a public employee's pension until they've paid full restitution, and so. Under 15.4, they forfeit it, but under 15.3, if full restitution is paid, then the monthly allowance would continue. So, Council, we took you out of order. Um, so back to that, that, that first um, issue. Uh, does it matter uh, that he had been retired either for, for whatever, for disability purposes? Does it matter? Um, in our analysis, whether they are a current employee uh, or in this case, like Mr. Mahan, that he's now on disability and had been on disability when this fraud was perpetrated? It's my argument that it doesn't matter for two reasons. The first reason is under Bonomo, this court has already established that 15-4 applies to both an inactive member and an active member. So it applies to Mr. Mahan. The second thing is that under Section 15, there is no statute of limitations. Under fidelity, a pension forfeiture occurs by operation of law. In, uh, it's mandatory. It occurs by operation of law. And the board instituting a hearing under Section 15 just formalizes something that already happens automatically by operation of law. So that's our position, that it applies to him, even as an inactive member. And there's no statute of limitations, although it took a number of years for the AG's office and the Suffolk County Sheriff's Depa Department to discover the fraud. It still applies to him. So that footnote 12 in Bonomo may be dispositive here in your favor, but do you agree this is the first case that we've had where the crime has been after the person has completely left public service? Can you repeat that question? Sure, sure. So the argument that just made, particularly about uh, Bonomo and footnote 12 and, and uh, Judge Justice Keenan's uh, comment, they could have just said member in service, um, might well be right. And your second point about no statute of limitations might well be right. But do you agree with the appellant that this is the first case that we have had where the uh, crime was committed after the person had finished their public employment? No longer public I, I, I don't necessarily agree because I, my position is that there's a connection and so that's what matters here, whether or not it goes back to his public employment and not so much the fact that he was inactive at the time. It, it's a compelling argument. I'm just trying to get for purposes of this case, whether this is the first case we will have had where we uh, are saying that we're going to apply 15 for forfeiture where the person is no longer a public employee. I would say it's not a case of first impression. Can I ask you just to re-articulate the direct factual link? So you're saying but for the fact that he was a corrections officer, uh, he would not have gotten injured and he got injured, therefore was entitled to workers' comp, and then two years later when he lied about it, that's enough of a, a nexus. That, is that the argument? The argument is yes, he was injured at work because of his injury that occurred at work. He applied for workers' comp, he received that benefit, and it goes back to his public employment. The rec is not really clear, just to clarify. He received his work, he received the ADR, Section 7, in 2005, but it was applied retroactively. Retroactive, right, yeah. And he, the record shows that he purchased Shamrock Motors in 2005. So. Yeah, but he's not convicted until 2000, for the 2006 mm -hmm. conduct. Until 2006, which is when he's awarded 34A. You're not that. relying on his recertification whenever he gets the workers' compensation that he's not able to work. That's not what you're relying on for that link. 
Can you rephrase that? Right, I mean, it sort of just goes back to Justice Kafka's point. I mean, he didn't receive a lump sum, right, at, at some point. He, he has to do some sort of certification every time he collects workers' comp that he, in fact, cannot work. Yes, every time he receives work, every six months he has to certify that he is not working or earning any income. And that is not the direct factual link that you're relying on. You're relying on the fact that he was injury put him in a position to then two years later lie. Yes, it goes back to his position as a corrections officer. Well, but are you really conceding that point? Because they're interrelated. He's defrauding you at He's, as Justice, Chief Justice Budd said, he should be working. Right. He's not working. He's lying that he has no earning capacity. He's affirmatively asserting this every six months. Do you really want to cut off part of that as part of your factual link, or are they all interrelated? I, I'm arguing that under Finnerin, they're all in, extrinsically intertwined, that they're related. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel.